All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. I am experimenting with a new type of going live, and I am going to be talking about some different stuff. I'm here. I've got my coffee, and I'm going to actively be making the index for this last sketchbook, this last nature journal that I filled, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And you might be wondering, index that's like that part in the book that has a lot of useful information and would help you find everything way easier but you usually skip it and just start flipping through all of the pages so it's okay if you're one of those people that skips the index go ahead and admit it right now i know i often do it's not exactly the sexiest part of the book but i'm telling you if you add an index to your nature journal, it can be awesome. And I must admit, I fell out of the habit of doing this. Um, I was doing it for a while. And um, like many things, I was inspired to do it by, guess who? John Muir Laws. That's right. So here is an example of an index. This is, look, this can be fun, okay? So you can sketch note uh, your index. Like, did you go on a bus trip? Well, here I drew a bus trip um, showing the transition from this dry ecosystem to a very lush ecosystem. And that's what I nature journaled about on these pages. So your index doesn't have to be some dry thing um, like, the back, like the back of this book, the part that you always skip. Your index can be visual and verbal at the same time. And you know, that really, if you're, if one of your reasons for nature journaling is that you want to remember things, now this is going to help you so much. Like, look, the mantid on page 81, 82. Just by seeing that in my index, I'm already like, wow, I remember when that happened. That was a really cool moment. And then I can go find it um, so much easier. And if you're like me, um, at a certain point, you end up with a stack of these, and it gets hard to actually find things. Um, so this is something some people have done a better job of creating a system. I'm still a little bit disorganized, but creating a system where you can easily go back, find the nature journal from a given year, from a given trip, go into an index, um, find the page where... Um, you nature nature journaled about um, bromeliad flowers and Inga genus branches and just go to that page uh, without flipping through because it can be fun flipping through tons of pages to find stuff in your nature journal because you see things that you forgot about but also being able to go straight to that bromeliad flower um, and have this version of it here in my index is super helpful so um, today, I am going to actually be creating an index um, for the nature journal that I just finished. And what I'm going to do, this is going to be a little bit different than my usual videos, but what I'm going to do is um, you can hang out with me while I do it. I'm going to put on a little bit of music. Um, you could index your own nature journal if you want while I'm doing mine, um, or you can just watch along um, and chill. So. I'm not going to talk too much more about like the benefits of doing an index. You saw this one. Maybe I'll go through this um, another time. This was a really fun trip. But I'm going to take this nature journal that I just finished. I mean, I still have a little bit more about the Grand Canyon that I'm going to do. Um, but I'm pretty much finished with this one. So I'm going to create the index for it. Um, put on a little bit of music. You can hang out. And that's what I'm going to do get this music back on here all right so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go through and number my pages in this corner here and if you're using some uh spiral bound sketchbooks like i do you can actually put the number in a part of the page that won't show up on scans so i'm going to go through and do that whole part And I'm going to use this gray pen. I always mark this one as zero.
For some reason, the music's not working. This was fun, nature journaling skulls that we found in pellets. I was doing a lot of um, sketch noting in my nature journal this year. I was working on this one kid um, with lots of concepts from physics. And you can see here, we were talking about wedges. Um, we were uh, making some cordage out of um, primitive materials. And this shows you how your drawings might look different when you're um, when you're teaching. So teaching is a, a very different thing than creating like a focused, um, you know, natural looking representation of something. And sometimes when you're teaching, you have to go quickly. And I, I find that sketch noting a sketch noting approach um, is usually the, the most helpful um, for teaching. Also, it's harder to make like really in-depth drawings when you're talking to someone at the same time. Here we were doing some different knife skills and talking about tension and compression in plant branches. Ooh, an empty page. Sometimes um, I come back and I mark these pages with a sticky note. Um, when I find a blank page in the middle of my nature journal, and then I can come back and add something. One thing you can do um, that's quick, if you're going for like an aesthetically pleasing like overall journal, you can come back to these pages and um, do something like big swatches like this. You could easily fill up a page quickly with something like that. Sometimes even just drawing your frames like drawing these these frames and not even putting anything in them, like practicing your layouts can be a quick way to fill a page like that. And I want to show you another way um, to, from a design perspective, to fill a page like that that's aesthetically appealing. Let's see. So you can do the thing where you go under a tree and you trace the shadows. And then afterwards, I mean, even this would be a cool design element to just fill in this blank page instead of leaving a blank page. Um, it's really simple, and these, I also call these palate cleansers, so it's sort of like when you go drinking wine, and uh, between glasses of wine, you drink a little bit of water, having a, a, a design, a kind of bold, um, stylized design on a page, um, alternating with these other pages that are more technical, nature journaling-wise, um, can be really nice because it just gives you this, this variation. Um, or doing like a simple landscape pico page in between. So I'm marking this page um, with a sticky note and I'll come back and do something there. Um, this was when I went fishing that time. I'll also sometimes come back in and put titles on things. So I'm gonna create a title for this one. You can see um, I have a pretty good composition I'd say going. Some of you probably watched this video. This was the episode about uh, putting your other nature hobbies in your nature journaling. And so I just um, nature journaled um, when I was fishing out at Spring Lake. And that was something I had never done before. So I want to encourage you to use a nature journaling approach to, um, to think about whatever other hobbies you have. Like I would love to see someone apply a nature journaling approach to some uh, fiber arts, like knitting or something like that. I think that the nature journaling approach of thinking about things visually and verbally would be applicable to almost any hobby. So now I'm going to come back in and I'm going to use a similar, you can see I used gray consistently for all of the text on this page. And for the drawings, I used the black ink and watercolor. So what I'm going to do for the title is just space it up here. And I'm probably just going to write fishing. Um, I could write on here, you know, that this was for a Nature Journal Show episode, um, but for right now, I'm just going to write fishing. And sometimes with bubble letters, I will use my Tombow pen um, in advance and lay in 
block in what um, where the letters are going to go. Um, sometimes just freehanding it is a little bit dangerous, and you end up with those things where your your letters get crumped, uh, squished in, crumpled up in the corner. Fishing, at least going through and kind of spacing it out is is good. And one thing that always uh, messes me up is, uh, you know, in in English, our lowercase letters, some of our lowercase letters have tails that come down. And oftentimes I'm adding in a title above another visual element that's already been drawn in. And if I don't think about um, that lowercase letter with the tail coming down, I have to push it up. So for example, this word here, snag, you can see that the, the G has this tail that's an important design element because if you think about it otherwise this word all fits into this kind of really clear box here and that box or in this case it's an arc is your design element and if in your mind you're imagining your your words in those boxes but then you have a, a, a lowercase letter with a tail coming down um, and suddenly that totally changes it and you can see here I ran into that and I also was squishing a little bit and it creates I mean I think this is okay but like to tell you the truth from a design perspective I don't think this looks that great um, so paying attention when you're doing your lettering and at least planning for those ones um, and then there's also of course lowercase letters that have um, tails um, I don't know if they're called tails. I should talk to someone who knows about calligraphy, like JP. But the part that comes up into this this area here affects the design a lot too. And I'll probably find some in here uh, that I can show you where the title has that uh, unplanned uh, little tail dangling down from a lowercase letter that is uh, getting in the way. But that's something to think about and one benefit of blocking in the letters before you do it. But I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> the metacognitive piece, the self-awareness piece comes in here because you have to think about for yourself um, which is a bigger problem for you. Is the bigger problem being too much of a perfectionist and never actually trying anything? That's a worse problem to have because you won't learn anything from it. But like if you just go all uh, freehanding everything and don't plan or think about in advance, you end up with other problems, but those problems might be ones that you learn from. So like right now, check this out. I have to put in this G and uh, it's going to come out of this really nice orderly block, design block or design element that the rest of my text is in. Um, and it's going to put it down like into this zone here, which just from a purely aesthetic point of view um, is going to be a little bit confusing, especially since I'm using this nice, really clear, empty space in between my lettering with these bubble letters. Uh, if I have a G and I keep the G with the consistent kind of size, um, it's going to come down into here. So I have the option of like squeezing the G up a little bit higher. Um, and uh, that doesn't look the greatest, or I could just turn this into an apostrophe right here, and I think I'm actually going to do that because that's kind of funny. Um, and then I'm going to write, and nature journaling. Now I'm going to change my text to a smaller one. If I kept going with this same size text, it wouldn't fit into there, so um, I'm going to change it to like almost this size. So thinking about when you're nature journaling, if you really want to get into this like design and layout and all of that, um, it's sort of like a book. You have to think about like how many different uh, heading do you have? Is this like a heading and this is like a subheading and then this is just like um, your body text. Thinking about that hierarchy of information is important. So this is still part of the title. If I make fishing and nature journaling um, if I make that the same size as all of this text down here, that would make it at least it not subordinate to this, but on the same level. And my metadata is over here too. I'm noticing my metadata is also the same size and color. So one option would be to do a different color. Another option would be to make it just a slightly bigger size, like in between this size and that size. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm eyeballing it and thinking nature journaling, I won't be able to actually make very big. I could split it up into two lines, but that won't look the greatest. Um, so I think what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use color here um, to make it stand out more. And I'm going to use black, uh, the same black I used for the drawings. And let's see how that goes. Fishing. And nature, scoping out my space here so I don't just squish all at the end. If you're going to squish, it's better to squish from the beginning than to have to all of a sudden do it at the end. Woo, that was close. That was so close. That's actually a little bit too close for comfort. See how that's butting up right against there? So now I'm not going to get too OCD about this because... Um, yeah, finding the balance there between your perfectionism, especially now I'm in the middle of indexing my book. I'm just adding a couple things. Don't want to get too particular, but hopefully you um, got a couple ideas from those, um, what I just mentioned about some layout stuff. And that's just, you know, if you really want to get into it. Okay, so moving onwards, we keep adding some numbers. Here's the rest of the fishing. If I wanted to, I could come back in and um, add color. So this is something I'll make a video about in the future, but you know, you can go out in the field, get your basic information in, like this map right here. There, if I wanted to, this is all I could do in the field. I'm like standing up. I'm not going to get into like super detailed, like, oh, let me draw in these contour lines and like making like perfect cross hatching. It's hard to do those kind of things when you're in the actual field or like these fish here. Um, if I wanted to, you know, if any of you want to do this, you can, is, is to go on the field, capture this basic information, and then when you get when you get home or it's raining outside or, or it gets dark at night, then you can come back in and add it. And the cool thing from a, a neuroscience point of view is that um, when you do this type of review, it's really good for your brain. So um, your brain will remember things so much better and that kind of reprocessing of the information, that raw information that you collected during the day is a really good way to, um, to mentally review it, to think about it, to come up with new ideas. You could add more questions. So like here, for example, I've got all this space down at the bottom. A really good practice would be to just um, right now even, this was back a couple months ago, but right now as I go through my journal and do this sort of review and create my index, I could um, add like 10 questions, 10 new questions that I have about this particular event. This was um, some more nature journaling, um, kind of uh, sketch noting um, with this kid that I've been teaching. And we were uh, learning about how levers work um, with fulcrums. And so you can see how all that stuff is totally nature journalable and then we um, based on what we were reading um, we tried to calculate how how we could um, balance off, balance um, the weight of the kid um, with by creating a lever and putting something not as heavy to balance him on the other side and you can see just sketch knowing that it's really fun <clears throat> Lori's asking why I start at page zero I don't know um, it's uh, it just feels like zero is the first, even though zero, I guess, is not a number. But and also, I usually that it, that page is kind of like a page out of the sequence. It's like the first page. Oftentimes, I don't put anything on it. Uh, maybe this should be page zero, but it feels like it's kind of uh, um, it's not in the regular sequence. A lot of times, what I'll put here is like some type of um, just fun drawing. Let's see what I did in my Ecuador one. So this is one thing I used to do is on that page, and this is a good idea, actually, I recommend for anyone. This page zero, uh, put your um, put information so that if you're if you if your um, if if your journal gets lost, people can return it to you. All right. So, anyways, good question, Lori. All right, I'm going to continue here with the numbering 1920, 21. Here was a fun trip. This is on a video. Some of you probably saw the one about nature observation a couple weeks ago or maybe a month ago. 
This was at the Hallberg Butterfly Gardens. And you can see it's really nice when um, there's consistency. And I don't know if I've been using the same, I should probably just commit to this and, and continue to do it, but see how this uh, gray, similar size box with my metadata on multiple pages, just having that consistency is, um, it, it adds to the aesthetic, but it's also just so much easier for um, someone to look through here, whether that's you or that's another person and find the information. Here was a lot more nature journaling with that kid. Um, we did some experiments about, you know, experiments on paper, conceptual experiments about how to use a lever to balance um, a, a large amount of weight with a relatively small amount of weight. Um, some sketch noting with him. Then here's that Hallberg butterfly garden stuff. One uh, pro tip here I want to give for anyone who's a teacher or even if you're not a teacher, I mean, look at these sticky notes right here. So this is this big size of sticky note. And what I like to do with these is I'll create a curriculum or like a plan for the day, like an outline um, with sort of like chunks of time. And then I'll stick that sticky note into my nature journal. So if you want to give yourself nature journaling prompts to practice, this would be a really good technique too, because if you wrote that down, if you wrote that down on the paper in your journal, later in the day when you're like on page two or page three or whatever you have to flip back to that page to see your notes but with one of these sticky notes right here you can move it so say you write down like um you write down maybe you watch one of like john muir law's uh, nature journaling classes and he shows you a couple tips about how to draw birds well you could just write like tip one two three that you want to remind yourself of and then like maybe a little sketch note of like start with the body shape and then like do the um do the angle like on the clock and you want to like remember that for the angle of how the tail comes out or something and then you have here just like um don't be hard on yourself and then you have like um some other reminder or whatever thing you want to practice in that nature journaling session, put sunscreen on. <laughs> um, and uh, do metadata. And then five, um, have fun or something. So I do this with like a curriculum when I'm teaching a class or teaching an individual. And then I have this sticky note here. So say this is ours um, for our personal session. And then um, you, you go out there with your empty book, like these pages are already filled, but this would be your empty book. Um, you have this note right here, your nature journaling over here. And then once you fill this page, you can just take, since this is a sticky note, you can take this sticky note and stick it on the next page and you have your reminder right there. I mean, you could even use this for if you're practicing layouts, like I talked about in some of my other recent videos, you could have a thing here that shows you some of the different page layouts you wanna try. So you're gonna try this one where you have the metadata up there and you have this other block. Um, you're gonna try the one where you have like text here, um, an image in the middle, and then more text below. And then you're gonna try the one where it's like, um, two landscape ethos and text and you just tell your, you plan in advance okay these are the three page layouts I'm going to use today and you just put that on this sticky note you put the sticky note there then when you're out nature journaling um, you're like ready to go and this sticky note has your um, reminders it has whatever layout you want to use and then you just bring it with you once you, you turn the page uh, okay, now I'm over like in this part of the journal, you, uh, you know, you come through a few pages and that sticky note is perfect to just put back down there uh, and then you have it there across from wherever you're doing your active nature journaling. So anyways, that is just a little pro tip for you. Um, I see Anita's on here. Hi, nature sketches. Um, I am safe um, and it's been really smoky, but um, I am safe. Thank you for asking. And I'm just doing talking about indexing here, creating an index and also doing a little bit of a, a page flip, a bonus page flip to go with it. 
drinking some coffee, hanging out, looking at this. This is a brainwashed caterpillar that I got to see. And if you saw my video um, called Nature Observations in your nature journal, where I'm at the Hallberg Butterfly Gardens, you might have seen this one already. Um, but this is an example of a page where I planned on adding in text. You can see these Tombow pin marks there. That all would have been text on top of there. I didn't end up adding the text. You can see in some ways that's actually kind of nice just to have that there. And aesthetically is kind of interesting. It's a placeholder for text and I never added the text. And this is something when you do your review day or you do your homework, um, you could come back into here and you could add text. Like I could do, um, I could do some research on these braconid wasps and then I could write that information in here. And that's what I was planning to do, but I never got around to it. And that's something that you have to find the right balance with. I know some people feel like this, this takes the fun out of nature journaling. If while they're out there in the field, they're basically creating homework assignments for themselves. And if you have a, you know, an unfair expectation of yourself to go home and like do all this research and do like three hours of nature journaling after you um, make dinner and wash the dishes and, or, or, you know, like wake up earlier in the morning and um, do it then, you know, that might be an unrealistic expectation for a lot of us. So this idea of leaving space um, for nature journaling in the future is a tricky subject and it, it works well for some people, but I can just um, share from my own experience that a lot of times I don't get to the homework because when I'm in the field, that's when I'm really excited and motivated. But by using this Tombow pin and making these lines, um, it is creating like homework for myself, but at the same time, even when I don't fill it, I kind of like the way that looks. I wish I could get, um, I'm gonna mess with the light a little bit here because it seems, it seems like things are coming out a little bit overexposed, but you can see the pale gray Tombow pin um, there. Ooh. And uh, yeah, so it still leaves kind of a nice aesthetic element. This is a page here you can see where I don't have any metadata. So as I go back through and number my pages for creating this index, uh, I could add meta I could add metadata to this page. But I'm just going to blow through this numbering um, real quick, and then I'm going to get to the actual indexing part. So bear with me for a second. 24, 25. That was a video too. You probably saw that one. I love this one. I want to do more, um, more studies of light and shadow. More homework that I created for myself, more empty pages that need to be filled in. I'm going to watercolor these. Um, just do a big, huge wash and fill in these spots. I drew this underneath the tree. These are the shadows. I think this was in a video also. Um, this is a great technique if you're feeling low energy. This is also a really cool technique to do on your like page zero. Um, like it would be really cool if you just did this in every single one of your nature journals and have like a consistency on your uh, page zero and the inside cover. Um, you could do the, go stand under a tree, trace these shadows. Now this is this can get tricky. So what I do is is like what they do in comics is they make they make X's inside of the shape that's going to get colored, or else you might get confused later. Then um, if you can do acrylic, like on this 150 GSM paper, I used to do acrylic stuff in my decorative stylistic elements in my nature journal. Um, but you could also just do a big huge watercolor wash and then fill in this space and it looks really cool. I mean, this can look cool just like that too. Um, and definitely if you're gonna be doing a full wash, um, use these bulldog clips because if you're doing a full wash on like this 150 GSM um, paper, then it's gonna start curling up a lot and it's gonna get kind of squirrely on you, especially if you use a spiral bound it might move and you could end up with a big patches of color on other pages. And then if you're really perfectionist and um, 
have gotten all precious with your journal, especially now that it's a completely filled journal, then you're going to be really sad when the watercolor like creeps over the edges or goes through these holes right here onto your other pages that were like so perfect looking. Three, two, three. Oh, more unfinished pages. Whatever shall I do? Um, I also like to smash mosquitoes into my nature journal, and I have them from like three or four continents. So maybe someday in the future they could um, clone um, me from the mosquitoes that have uh, bitten me while I'm nature journaling. Here you can see another handy dandy sticky note, and you can see how I organized my curriculum for. Um, I was mentoring this teenager, and we were learning about some um, natural materials and using knife skill skills and making primitive traps and connecting that to basic physics. And you can see here that I basically planned my day out into these chunks. You could do this with your nature journaling outing, even if you're not an educator. Um, these sticky notes are a super helpful way like I showed you and then you can just keep moving them and then afterwards you could take all of these and you could have like a file where you save them um, and then you'd have that information for later when you're planning curriculum. Here's a quiz that we did. I made a, a pop quiz for him and we had to use drawing to show the different um, knife safety rules so you can see um, this is don't walk while using a knife. <laughs> um, but practicing sketch noting like this is something that I haven't done enough. But you can see how if you're if you are capable of mastering um, like stick figures and showing stuff like this, there's a lot of information that you can communicate. And even if you're just nature journaling um, subjects like in nature, this is this kind of thing can be a really useful thing to be able to communicate information. I'm going to be interviewing Mark Simmons in a couple um, a couple weeks from now on a Sunday at 1 p.m. and he's going to talk about like finding the story. And he's a comic artist who also nature journals, so he uh, is really good at this kind of stuff. Um, Lori is asking about the sticky notes and these I think I got them on Amazon and they came in a huge pack so I had to get like 12 of these um, post-it notes um, all together but you can see here they're 98.4 um, millimeters by 149 millimeters so three and seven eighths inch by five and seven eighths inch um, and these like I think it you had to get like 12 of these packs um, but it was worth it and I, I seriously use them I really like the way and you could fit this in a fit this in a smaller size sketchbook too it doesn't fit in my moleskin my small moleskin planner that I use for my daily planner uh, but uh, unless I fold them and I actually do fold them sometimes and then I put them in my planner but these are really cool and I use them for nature journaling like I just showed you you could write your if you're working on some like affirmations or like you're being having issues with your um, inner critic or whatever you could write those things down you could write some notes from the last class you saw with John Muir Laws um, you could um, draw a couple of different layout types um, and yeah, so anyways, those are really cool. I see Ivea is on here. Hi, Ivea. Um, yeah, I am also going to interview, I'm interviewing Miriam Morrill about fire journaling because um, she's an expert on fire. I'm going to be interviewing her on this coming Sunday and at 1 p.m. And then I'm inter uh, I interviewed Heather already, and I think that episode will come out on um, Wednesday. And then I'm interviewing Brian in um, a couple weeks, so lots of interviews coming up. But I'm going to keep going ahead with this uh, indexing project and showing you my pages at the same time. Maybe this is how I should always do uh, my page share. Here you can see I was nature journaling mosquitoes again. I also left a space that never got filled. But this was while backpacking. This was nature journaling while backpacking in the Sierra. Super fun. Super fun. I 
Um, Yves asking who else I'm going to be interviewing. Um, let me make sure I'm not getting my numbers wrong because I'm talking so much. Maybe I shouldn't have had that coffee. More, here are some more um, pages from the Sierra Nevada. Really funny. You can see how consistency with your landscape Vito size is really powerful. Um, just by continually making those rectangles and squeezing your landscape Vito's into there. Like, it would have been easy for me to try to paint this scene like as one big huge page and it probably would have sucked um and uh but by squeezing them into these small things you can get more done um and it looks better all right i'm gonna continue with the numbering oh no more blank pages more curriculum i was teaching kids how to draw with charcoal and at the same time we we're measuring the tide i was also teaching them about venting so here's more practice um <laughs> here's more practice sketch noting look at this this is super funny see these are all diagrams to show venting um what is venting here's stuff being strewn from a crater or maybe a pimple here's stuff being strewn from the mouth here's stuff coming straight out the back of the head and here i tried to draw a vent so this is something I don't do enough, but really, I'm telling you, uh, I highly recommend practicing it um, if you can. But I was um, working with these teenagers, and um, I was teaching them how to use venting in your journal. So they were allowed to write um, whatever on a piece of paper and then rip it up or burn it afterwards. Because I think venting is one of the, if you've seen my video about the seven benefits of journaling, um, then uh, then you know that venting is one of them. And oftentimes we vent to other people, um, but uh, venting in your journal is really powerful because then you can spare the other people in your life. Uh, and you can also vent things that maybe you wouldn't to other people. So I think teenagers in particular, if you can teach them a nature journaling technique, then venting is, is, definitely, uh, is definitely something that all teenagers should know how to do. 45, 46. This was at Salmon Creek, uh, one of my favorite places for nature journaling this last um, last season, or last book, 46, 47. A lot of these are from videos you've probably seen. This was out at Salmon Creek, too. This was so cool this was nature journaling at night um this was like the last the last time i've been the, the only nature journaling physical field trip that i've i've been to in the last like six months um and uh it was at the hallberg butterfly gardens during moth week and i was so excited about nature journaling moths at night and, and practicing some nocturnal nature journaling techniques that was really cool. Um, Akshay and Gargi were there. JP was there. Um, it was kind of a small group, and you had to, like, reserve for it. And it was, like, a drive up to Sonoma County for people in the Bay Area. But it was really cool. Um, I started this thing uh, where, where I was going to try to do this thing where I have the time going along the bottom. And this is sort of like what people do for their solstice journals, but not so uh, precise. But it's more of like a graph. Like along here is a time is a timeline. So like starting at 8:30 p.m. Um, and then I would draw in this axis. I would draw the uh, the moths and other things that came to the light. So it would be cool to like color this in or or make it like more of a graph, you know. But um, there's this is a cool thing that I had never tried before. And you can see each individual drawing doesn't need to be very good. Um, so this is the kind of thing you could, this is the kind of thing you could do while you're sitting on your porch, visiting your family in the South or, or wherever, and everybody else is doing something else. You could literally just make this thing, this line on the bottom of a piece of paper. You could do it on one of these sticky notes. You don't even need a full journal and you could have this line. Every, you're hanging out there with your family and, you know, having a good time with them. 
But at the same time, you're like, all right, I'm going to take advantage of all these cool bugs that live where my family lives. And I'm going to have this timeline starting from whatever, 6 p.m. People start drinking beer on the porch. You're, you got your beer too or whatever, but then you've got your journal going on here at 9, let's say 10 p.m. Easily people could spend that much time um, on a weekend, you know, hanging out. And then uh, here's you've got a light or whatever. There's a light on their, their porch, and you start drawing. Okay, well, at 6 p.m. there is these little mosquitoes, and you just draw. I mean, even if you just drew, drew like a stick figure mosquito um, with a little word next to it and a number, like there were seven of these. Um, and then at 7 p.m., there was like a, dra let's just say dragonfly. Um, a dragonfly came and landed on your uncle. Um, and you could write that landed on my uncle. And a yellow jacket um, got into your cousin's hair. Um, actually, there was three yellow jackets. You think they're yellow jackets, you're not sure. You're going to have to look them up on iNaturalist later. And then you just keep going, you know? Like, literally, you could be doing this while you're hanging out with the rest of your family. It doesn't take that much attention. Then at 8 p.m., the moths start showing up. Big fuzzy one. Oh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, okay, so Ivea's got a good point. So make your family, your family might be like, dude, why does Marley care more about the bugs than about us? Wait, why is it getting so, let me get this light fixed there, okay. Ah, can you see that okay? I sort of uh, rigged this up last minute, but, like, what about up here? You could just have quick little, like, and this is something that Mark Simmons would do. It could be part of your metadata. I used to do this for my metadata is, Here's your metadata, da, 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 uh, you know, half moon, uh, 80 degrees. And then you got your metadata there. And then next to the metadata, you could either just have the names or you could have like, uh, it's like the Brady Bunch, you know, like um, you can have all the people in your family, the little kids. The, the dog or whatever. And the pet turtle. Because everybody has a pet turtle, right? Um, this one has long hair. And some kind of like tank top. This one's wearing a hat. And suspenders. And this one has a long beard. So, I mean, like, literally, look, Yvea's got an idea, um, you know, include your family, you know, or whoever you're nature journaling with. How about just create little, and then you could put initials, you know, if you feel like those drawings don't represent them enough, like, if you can't tell if that's a turtle or your uncle, then put, like, the initials next to them and, uh, everybody will know who they are and that just adds something to your metadata that could be a teeny thing in the corner of your nature journal like I could have done that here um, on this page I, I wish I had because for whatever reason I don't see the names of I, I guess I didn't write down the names of the people that I was with um, I mean I made like a map but like Akshay and Gargi and JP were there um, my friend Megan was there who runs the Hallberg Butterfly Gardens and I could have included their names on here um, or done those little, if I had done little cartoon versions of them like this, like what Yvea is talking about, uh, that would have been awesome. All right, so let's see here. So that moth, moth time was cool. I did these colors in the field um, in the dark. I'm going to do another video in the future about nature journaling in the dark because um, I think it's underappreciated. Yeah. More fishing and nature journaling. Whoops, whoops. So this was this whole weekend I did with this kid um, where we used um, sketch noting. He was really interested in like mechanisms and 
Um, so we created, this is actually an archery target where it's like a dunk tank archery target where someone sits underneath this bucket full of cold water. Um, and then another person gets to shoot at this target. And if they hit the bullseye, it sets off this whole mechanism that drops the cold water on the person that's sitting down there. And this is a perfect example of something where it would have been better if I drew the person. Um, here, I'm going to draw the person sitting um, down here. Their hands on their knees. Sitting, waiting to get in fear, waiting to get dunked by cold water. And then the other person standing here. Whoa, there's going to be two kinds of arrows in this drawing. Ooh, drawing people doing archery is really hard. Hey, that's the best person doing archery, stick figure doing archery I've ever drawn. That's not saying much because it's usually really hard. So then that person there gets to shoot, and what we did is uh, um, his dad got to sit here. Well, I got to sit there too, um, and then he had to try to shoot the, the, um, the target over here. But basically you can see that with this kid, we've been practicing a nature journaling approach. But what he's really interested in is mechanisms and levers and watches and things like that. So we did all of this basically nature journaling approach to look at um, all of those mechanisms. And so one thing that, you know, I think is important to point out is that physics, the way physics works, the way friction and levers and momentum and movement um, and mechanical advantage, all of those things are nature because physics is part of nature. And so nature journaling about things just because it's not necessarily made out of organic materials um, or is not like a living organism, it is still part of nature. Anyways, more pages of that. That was a really fun learning experience. Oh, and there was all of these cool Ichneumonid Day wasps coming up to the light there. I kind of want to add um, color to that because those are some of my favorite invertebrates, but I think I'm going to skip it for now. Landscape Ito Boot Camp. Is that something that you would be interested in if I did that in the future? So sometimes I just write down ideas there in my nature journal. Here, speaking of landscape itos, this one got a little bit not so ito anymore. It's kind of big. Got my pancake batter. It reminds me of studying sand dunes with these kids. That was really fun. Sand dunes. What do you think about sand dunes and how sand moves in the water? Here are more of these wasps. Love them. Parasitoid wasps. Ooh, this was nature journaling in a drizzle and a thunderstorm. So I got my metadata up here. Um, I like how this one came out. I should. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put a mark here. So this is. This is another reason why I, I love sticky notes. So I'm gonna take this sticky note and I'm gonna um, say copy metadata. style metadata style <clears throat> and i'm going to stick that up here because i want to get a consistent um way of doing metadata the more more consistent you can be um the more consistent you can be with stuff like this the better your journals look and and the easier for um, looking up information here's an example i want to show about um a, a teaching event so i was teaching and uh we were doing like a sit spot and this was kind of a rough day because you know these kids just met me it was 11 in the morning they they, they kind of just woke up um that uh oh shoot Lori's reminding me that i didn't no i'm okay 62 63 i'm on 64. um nature is so distracting it's true <clears throat> so i was teaching these kids you know it's a lot to expect from a teenager to be up at 11 in the morning it's like it was it was cloudy and rainy and thundering um, and I chose this spot because it was supposed to be a really hot day um, 
And so we went to the most shaded foresty place that I could think of. And um, when we got there, you know, the weather was like really rough. So um, anyways, I adapted and, and, and the kids were really great. And um, we tried to do like a little bit of a sit spot. Um, and uh, what ended up happening is uh, one of the kids was really into it and was doing like this whole landscape ito. We were, we were doing a landscape ito and then writing stuff on the side that we notice. Ah, oh, that light's gonna, I'm gonna have to do something with that light soon. Um, and I noticed that one of the kids, she stopped nature journaling and started throwing rocks into the water. So that's the perfect opportunity for an adult to be like, uh, to, to think about like what's going on and what's actually important. And it would be really easy to be like, hey, stop throwing rocks into the water uh, and uh, go back to nature journaling like I told you to. But like I went over there and I was like noticing like, OK, she's interested in throwing rocks into the water. So I started nature journaling her throwing rocks into the water, asking questions about it um, and drawing it and just showing that instead of me like just uh, telling her not to do what she was doing, I was engaging with what she was doing and showing that that could be nature journaled also. So I think sometimes with teenagers um, or kids in general, um, it can be hard to just push them and say, um, especially this generation, it's, it can be hard to just push them and say, hey, um, you know, start nature journaling uh, the way I told you to instead of like throwing rocks into the water. Um, but if you sh if you instead are like, I'm not going to tell them necessarily what to do, but I'm just going to say I'm going to just show them how cool nature journaling is and that nature journaling can be applied to whatever they're doing already. Um, yeah. Here's more nature journaling sand and how the sand collects. So let's see. Six. I am going to um, get something to shade the window a little bit better to hopefully not have so much overexposure. Let me know if this looks better. And hopefully this cardboard won't fall down. Does that look better? That's better, right? Okay, great. Cool. So yeah, this is nature journaling sand dunes and how sand forms and settles out in different places. That was really cool. Oh, I'm about to go to the Sierra Nevada again. Six. Here I am drawing some, I think that was a juniper. Yeah. This is right when the fires were starting after the lightning storm. So you can see your nature journal can be a cool um, reminder of. So this was the day that the lightning was first happening in Northern California. Um, then I went on this trip. We had smoke. I wrote about the smokiness. Um, that was a fun trip. Drew that tree was really cool. Some landscapes. I think this is in a video that you probably already saw. This was one I did an Instagram post about this because I like how this came out. And I think I'm finally getting the hang of drawing this ice plant um, and getting the color of that ice plant. And that that's such a characteristic plant. It's invasive <clears throat> in Northern California. But it's such a characteristic plant um, and it has really interesting colors this time of year. But what I was struggling with was, um, or I didn't struggle with it, but I, I totally got it wrong. And if you look at my Instagram post, I have a photo of this landscape right next to my drawing, uh, my painting of it. And what you can see is that look how close the value is between, like if you blur your vision a little bit, look how close the value is between the sky back here and this grass. And um, the value in real life, this grass was way, way darker compared to the sky. And I even added, like you can barely see it. Some This was like a, a, a foggy day, like it often is at the coast here. There was a marine layer. Um, and in the photo, it looked really gray. 
So I did add a little bit, but that even takes the the color, the, the value, I should say, of the sky a little bit darker than the pure white over here. <clears throat> and then the, the color of the grass, this is the problem, is when you have um, temperature, like warmth, um, conflicting with um, value. So warmth is, you know, like, is it yellow? Is it orange? Is it red? And value is how dark it, it is. So like over here, I'm not distracted by, uh, there is no color. There is no warmth. Um, there's just the white paper and the black. It's all about value. Um, and value is really the most important thing, even in a landscape. So the hard part, though, is that when warmth and value, our brain kind of interpret them in similar ways and they get conflated. So this grass here was very warm. It was like yellows and, and, and sort of like this pale yellow um, or like kind of golden or I think saturation can also do the same thing. So a saturated or warm color can look like a lighter value color. And then when you try to paint it, you don't want to make it darker, even though it really is way darker than the sky. And this this whole thing needs to go back further darker. But it can be hard with watercolor to capture the correct warmth, the correct color, the correct saturation without sacrificing the value. And I think when it comes to it and the way your brain actually works is this is what this is what matters the most. And if you sacrifice value to get like a better color match um it actually takes a lot away from your drawing and uh, if i had matched the value instead of the color i would probably have more of a um, sense of depth in this drawing which is is kind of lost there there's there's a nice whimsical uh, aspect i'd say to this drawing but um anyways that's just the lesson i want to share there on that one trying to paint some um, smoke patterns. This is when um, the Wallbridge fire was um, visible from my window. Um, and I, I'm trying to practice the way that the, um, it can be hard in a, a skyscape to paint this transition from blue into orange. Um, and there was some of this like purple in the smoke too. So watercolor is obviously a great medium for um, trying to do skies and stuff like that. Before. Um, here's some practicing for uh, the Grand Canyon. Trying out different layouts. I need to do this more. So this obviously, if you saw my interview with JP, who, who here saw that interview? Probably a lot of people. But in that interview, um, she showed her the back of her book and everyone was like, what is that? Like every time she would flip the page, you'd get this little peek in the back and she has like all of these like diagrams showing different ways for organizing the information on her page. So I did that. I have never really done that intentionally before and I experimented with a few. I measured things so that this will be the same ratio as my actual page of my book. Um, so like this is three by four and my book um, is uh, nine by 12. And so these are all accurate representations of what the scale would look like. This is my, um, I created a frame. My landscape Ito frame is about this size and you could fit six onto a page um, in this layout. This is another frame, a new frame that I'm experimenting with that's slightly bigger. And I like the options I, I have with it as like a, um, an element this way, like uh, it's almost like a third of the page. Um, and I think for a, a landscape Ito where it's just like this central one here, you can see I'm experimenting with some stuff I think I'm gonna encounter in the Grand Canyon. I wanna do some of these geology um, graphs like that. See, so you can see here I, how I divided up the page. Each one of these is the same dimension as my entire page. Something I highly recommend, check out that video. Um, and we talk about that. Here was um, a class that Jack did, and it's it. I hardly ever end up getting uh, to be able to take any of his classes because I'm always working. Um, but here is one that I got to go to when he was teaching um, how to teach nature journaling, and I wasn't there for the whole thing. But 
um, I tried to sketch note and see, look, I'm trying to get better at this. It, it didn't quite work out. My next one's a little bit better, but I was like, I'm going to do the thing that Mark Simmons does and try to draw my teacher and all of that. And so I tried drawing Jack here. He's wearing his glasses, you know, and I, this, these marks I made above his mouth, I was trying to show like the shape of his like upper lip, but it didn't really work in that one. Um, but here, I think this one's a little bit better and you can see, I didn't put in any information above the lip. I think I got his hair a little bit better. Um, and his, he has a really big smile and a big, um, square chin. So I was trying to capture that, but then you can see, I'm just sketch noting and I'm using my, um, pale colored Tombow pen, um, as the, uh, for, for creating the, the layout. See? Okay, 76, 77, 78. I, I might have to do the actual indexing part on a different day because um, I'm only to page 78. Here is that new um, landscape Ito size I was telling you about. This is going to be in an upcoming video. I think I showed it a little bit on Instagram, but I'm going to talk about how to use these white markers to create this um, this uh these waves and sort of white water in the ocean and that's something people were asking me a lot about the other thing i'm trying to get better at is it's so it's al it's almost always foggy where i live so not al almost always but it often is foggy and so i'm trying to practice these skies where the fog comes down and almost looks the same color as the ocean um yeah trying to practice that this was that same trip really fun um, you can see this is one of those layouts that i showed on the previous page so if you don't understand how those work check it out this would be an example um, there's a big block down here there's a block of text in here about a third of the page and then another third up here um, has an element for metadata and then open space for drawings um, and then across from it so this would be a spread um, on the left side of the spread you have a bigger um, a bigger image of a landscape ito here's the rocks video i think this is, this is the video that came out last week drawing rocks i added a few things that weren't on there um that weren't on there before Maybe. See, if I had put the page numbers in before I started the journal, it would have been better. 283. You can see um, I was nature journaling with this kid about surfing, and it was like, okay, we got to go surfing. Now let's come back here and draw um, a map of what the lineup looks like. So in surfing parlance, the lineup is um, where people are sitting um on their boards waiting for waves and uh, it can be an important it, it's a really important thing to understand um you know like where you want to position yourself you can get information like where are the waves breaking and you kind of want to look at that stuff before you go out and go surfing um and so by doing an actual map of it like you could see oh there's only one person way down here like how are people spread out and how does that relate to the sandbars and the bottom of the ocean. Um, then I asked, uh, you know, I asked him, because we hadn't talked about how waves are, are created really, or how they how they form and break. Um, so based on this, um, this drawing, I think sometimes it's important to practice asking questions to people before you tell them the way to come up with the answer and to see, to, to, because part of what you're, you're, you're practicing or, or teaching is um, how to how to um, try to answer questions that you don't have a, a method for answering so so that the the practice is actually coming up with the method for answering instead of applying a method that someone gave you and so what i like to do um, when i'm working with kids and teenagers is to ask them the questions before i tell them the 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 methodology or the theory behind what we're looking at. And so in this case, oops, I should have drawn the water, colored water in there. These are all surfers sitting out in the lineup. 
Um, and you can see here, uh, it's supposed to show where the waves are starting to break. Um, and then what I, I tried to, to ask him, focus camera. Come on camera, you can do it. Sorry. Oh my goodness. So I've got this camera hanging from my lamp um, and it usually, the autofocus usually works fine, um, but now it's not for some reason. I wish I could hold it up that high. Dang it, come on. Let me see if I turn more light on. Whoa, whoa. Technical difficulties. All right, I'm going to switch camera here um, because this one seems like it's having trouble focusing. Maybe I'll just close it completely for a second. Sorry, we are experiencing technical difficulties. Please bear with us. All right, I'm going to switch the camera, y'all. To Oh, ooh, it's back. It's back. Haha. -ha, see, as soon as you threaten the camera and say you're going to turn it off, suddenly it starts working again. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay, so anyways, I asked the kid after we drew this map looking from above, actually it's sort of isometric perspective to tell you the truth. Um, after we uh, after we did this, haha, <laughs> Lori, I, I feel you on that one. I, I'm definitely not teaching remotely all day long, that's for sure. Um, thanks to everybody like you who, who are doing that. Um, now, look at this one here. So I asked him, okay, what would that look like from the side? And so um, what I was fishing for was for him to make to make his own uh, realization that there is a correlation between the depth, um, what's going on on the bottom of the floor of the ocean floor and what the waves are doing above the surface. Um, and so after giving him some time to think about that, I presented him with this hypothetical situation. What would the waves uh, how would the waves behave if the floor looked like that, um, if it got shallow and then got deeper again? That was fun. Nature journaling surfing. Yeah. Ooh, I love the pinguiculas. Look how that peach Tombow pin works there for me. So this is, I just reordered these. I thought they were no longer making them, but it's the 910. Um, I forget what they call this color, but it's it's like a peach color. When you first get it, it's a little bit too strong, I think. But it's probably <clears throat> going back to value versus um, color. Uh, this the value of this is really pale, and I love it because look, I can draw. Um, I can use it like uh, Jack uses the non-photo blue pencil. I can draw like my basic layout. So if I go look at my layout. Um, cheat sheet here. I've got my layout cheat sheet. See these shapes? I know exactly what I need to do. I take out this Tombow pin, look at my cheat sheet, and I just draw this on my whole page, these shapes right here with this Tombow pin. Then um, whatever that layout may be, then I start to fill in the information or add the titles or whatever. And you can see the pink is so pale, it actually almost disappears completely. It is water soluble. Um, but it fades into the background in a way that sometimes is actually adds like a really nice effect. Um, so I love that Tombow pin. Um, I don't think very many people purchase those colors because sometimes it's hard to get these. You can see here I'm experimenting with the circle. Love Bella Perinis's, um pages that she's been sharing and I've seen that in her nature journal. Um, she also started the Nature Journaling German Language Group. I just uh, interviewed her recently. Um, she uses circles all the time, and they look really cool. Um, so that's something I want to work with in my compositions. And you can see on my cheat sheet, there's no circles, but I should make one. Okay, you can see I'm getting consistent with repeating this one um, layout. Here I did it with pencil. Do you see those pencil lines? down there in the back. Um, that's showing this new layout I've been working on and this landscape Vito too. Um, while I was planning for the Grand Canyon, I made a new, uh, lots of you have seen this frame that I use and this is my smaller one, 
for landscape pitos, like what I used in the back there in the Sierra. Um, and this is a great size. It's a really good, um, fast landscape pito. Um, and this is about the size I used on my whole Tanzania trip. Really good one. Um, but I've been experimenting with this one, which is a little bit bigger. It's like probably like three, three times more um, surface area. And it divides my page almost evenly in three. So what you can see here is that I, I did one here, I did one here, and I did one here. And that this, even though I don't have a square around it, it's still um, in the mind, it, it's, it's like a design block. Over here, I didn't even do them at all. I mean, there's a little bit of graphite, but you can see it's like these three design blocks. Now, this is something I actually was considering like, ooh, I could use my gray Tombow pin because I think that one would actually work better here. And I could go in and trace this rectangle. I'm going to do that right now. Okay, so I've tried all of the Tombow pins to see which ones are, are the palest value because what I really care about is value, not color. And I, why, I, I'm not into the Tombow pins for color are not the way to go. Anyways, if you want color, use seriously like watercolor. Like this would have been really hard to do with Tombow pins. Tombow pins are great for simplifying. So get the simple colors and, and get a value range. So this is the N95. I think they named it after the mask. Um, and it's like the N stands for neutral though, in this case. Um, and I want neutral here cause check it out. This is all black and white drawing with a little bit of graphite. So just to, to, um, make that design element stand out a little bit more, um, for this page, I'm going to, to trace it with my Tombow pin. I could do with the pink one, but I think the neutral one, you can see that's pretty pale too. That might not even, whoa, that was a little bit goofy there. I should have scoped that out first. Um, this might not even hardly show up in the camera. It's so pale. Um, you could use this as a shadow color too. Like if I want to, I could just draw the bottom of the box. Um, I could then go in here and even use it in these process arrows and, and making these like slightly three-dimensional um, would be kind of cool and add to legibility. So I'm going to make these um, blow up boxes also um, shadowed with this Tombow pin. And this one's very pale. It might even be, I mean, the light in here is kind of weak too, but check out what that, you can see that it adds a little bit of a drop shadow, barely visible to this camera, adds a little bit of a drop shadow um, onto those, um, those elements. And I think maybe I would have used the pink or I could even use the gray that I used for my text. Whoa, almost put the wrong color down right there. You could also, another thing you could do is you could put, um, going back to warmth, um, in a color, you could use that peach color, um, that I like so much as the top part of the frame and then the gray color on the bottom and since the gray color is neutral or cool um, it will like recede into the into the, the background more and uh, the peach will stand out and that'll create some more like dimensionality but look look there I think that looks pretty cool um, you can see I have objects busting out of the frame there these are these fruit I didn't put a title on this one um, but that's fine there's it, I would have to kind of squish it in there um, but that page composition looks pretty good, and those are just sketches, so um, that came out pretty good. This is when I was starting to nature journal um, every day for this month. Oh, yeah, now we're getting to some familiar stuff that I've just been doing the last few days. Some of you probably remember this. Um, A6. Now, one thing I didn't mention is if you're nature journaling in different locations, um, like I have been, you could even rip out pages and stick them in. Um, so leaving some spaces like for my waterproof pages, um, adding, adding some, adding some of those pages, like cutting them out of those, uh, right in the rain journals and sticking them in would be cool because like here I did this cause there's sort of like a, um, diachronous thing going on here where my journal is skipping around through time. 
And this right here would actually be better associated with some of the drawings I did in my waterproof journal when I was in the pond, because I drew this from the pond. So that's one thing you could think about um, if you if you manage multiple journals or you want to keep it all in like one big journal, having some space and then cutting stuff out. And that's sort of like more like what scrapbookers um, are good at. So that might be a good place to look at what they're doing and copy them. Here's some planning I'm doing of how to incorporate maps into my pages. JP has given me so many ideas, but you can see here, um, I'm trying to figure out ways. This is a river map. So that's the um, Colorado River coming down right here through the Grand Canyon. Um, and I'm trying to come up with ways that I could show, like this is what happened there, and then have like a landscapeito showing there. Um, or up here, it's like, we found this scorpion in our camp, and then this arrow points to the camp where we were at. So I'm experimenting with layouts. Here's a version of, of a map, a, a Colorado River map, um, with one of the most intense rapids right there. Um, Austin Cleon, yeah, what is he? still like an artist. Um, yeah, so here's an example of... Um, uh, another uh, version of the map that I did and the topographic maps would take forever to draw so I actually traced this one and even that took forever but just getting some ideas of how to do that Woo! that's the last few pages and I think I'm gonna have to um, make a video later where I actually show the indexing in the back um, but I'm gonna use I'm not gonna use this page I'm gonna use um, this page and the inside cover and I'll, I'll show you the one I did before um, for Ecuador. And this is like probably my favorite index that I've ever done. Um, and I, I, for a while when I got really into indexes, I was on every one I was drawing a hand because index finger and index, the thing in the back of the book, come from the same Latin root, indicia, indicare, to point. And the idea is that the index points you to where you need to go okay so everybody uses this finger a lot and it's really important but not everybody uses the index in a book and much less do we add an index to our own books but if you don't have imagine if you didn't have an index finger on your hand you would be well how would you point at things you know like that it, it just would be a big problem so uh, think about putting an index into your nature journal i highly recommend it it can be super fun like here's where we're on a river trip now look that it's like don't tell yourself like oh marley's talented i can't do that because seriously look at these these are stick figures um and bubble letters and just blocks of color okay so that's stuff um that you can do um and you can add writing in different sizes look this head right here um, with like kind of like a calendar in front of it, that's not that hard to do. Or some sort of blocks like this. Look at this butterfly. So all you really need to do is something super basic like this. You need to count the pages, unless your, your journal already has numbered pages. I think on this one, um, I wrote the page numbers in um, before the trip started. I had already written them in. But it's like so much easier for me to find this praying mantis page um, and so much cooler because I have this. This is like the hierarchy. This is like the, the meta level. You could have all of your journals on the wall like I do. And um, having all those journals on the wall, uh, it gets it, after a certain point, it gets really hard to find anything. So look back there. So if I need to find a journal, I have to go through. And I think there's like there's like over 30 back there. And it's really hard to find things, uh, specific things that I want to share for a video, for example. You've probably seen, I use sticky notes in the tops, but writing the writing on there on the front and then having an index, seriously, it, it helps. And I know that a lot of people who nature journal are doing it to have better memories of, of their experiences in nature. So if you want to have better memories of your experiences in nature and you want to actually be able to find some of your nature journaling stuff and learn from your past experiences, then I highly recommend adding an index to your nature journal. Thank you everybody for joining in today. It was super fun. Lori, it was great to see you. Ivea, um, everybody who's here, nature sketches, all of you, super, super fun. And I'm going to be doing more videos in the future. I'm going to 
go to the Grand Canyon. I'll be gone for 21 days, but I'm gonna make all my videos in advance um, and share them with you on here. Bye.